Wednesday morning. Welcome to Begin in the Word. Our text today comes from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, where the Bible says, For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election, for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We continue here a study in 2 Peter chapter 1. We did not cover in this series the verses immediately preceding verses 3 and 4. We actually covered those back in a series earlier in the year on verses that are often neglected by Christians. We reran that episode yesterday, so I hope you had a chance to see that. But that connects immediately to the beginning of verse 5. For this very reason, because we are partakers in the divine nature, because of what God has done for us in making us his own, because of that, he transitions now into some of the obligations and responsibilities that flow from that. For this very reason, make every effort. How hard must we try? How hard must, how much must we give in our effort to serve God, to be a faithful Christian, to grow and to mature? He says, make every every effort. Don't give up. It's a daily grind of growth, just like someone might work out physically, and that's it's taxing. It's physically demanding. It's difficult. That's why so few people do it on a regular basis and can stick with it. It's the same type of effort it takes to grow as a Christian. But we have such great motivation in that Christ has died for us, that God has redeemed us, and we are partakers of in that divine nature. We can use that as a motivation to grow for this very reason, make every effort to grow. This word here, supplement, to supplement your faith with virtue. It's a very interesting word. Some translations translate it as the word add. It's worth calling out right now that it is the same word used down in verse 11, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom. This word referred to a wealthy benefactor who would help support putting on plays in in Greek life, in Greek culture. You might have very expensive aspects to running a play, like paying for the the chorus that would take part in a a Greco-Roman style play. And this word would refer to the the giving, the furnishing, the the paying for the great expense associated with that play that this wealthy benefactor would perform. And it makes perfect sense in verse 11 to be used in that way, for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance. In In this context, it is God who is richly providing. He is that benefactor giving that benefit to us, this entrance into the eternal kingdom. It's a little unusual, however, to see the word here in verse 5. There is something of a furnishing going on. There's something of a giving going on. You have, it's it's assumed in this text, that you already have your faith. This book started out in the opening verses that we are of equal standing in our faith. And there it refers more broadly to the faith. But included in that is our own personal belief and trust in God that brought us to this point. And we are assumed to already have faith and we are to generously give generously, liberally give to add to that faith. And he gives here a chain of um, of things we are to build on top of that initial faith. Every effort, generously, liberally give. That's the kind of attitude we are to have when it comes to our own Christian maturation and growth. Now, there's some debate among commentators. The, the eight qualities listed here, are these eight qualities meant to be consecutive? Are they building on top of one another? Is it something that they're just a list of eight, and they have no progression to them at all. There's debate there. It seems to me, though, that this word supplement or add or provide or furnish, however you want to translate that, implies the idea of a building, of a progression. So we start with the faith we have, and we add to it virtue or excellence or moral excellence. I think one way to look at this word virtue is if you are a pagan unbeliever and you had one set of of virtues, one set of what you believed was good and excellent. You are to realign that now with what God has said. 
You have now come to the Christian faith and your definition of moral excellence now has changed. So add to your faith virtue. There are many Christians who stop their progression right here. They come to faith in Jesus. They say, at least with the mouth, that they believe that he is the son of God, but they refuse to realign their thinking about what is good, what is excellent with what God has said. And so their Christian maturation dies on the vine. They get to one step. We are to add to our faith virtue. To our virtue, we are to add knowledge. And this is a theme in this book. We see it, we saw it already in the opening verses. We see it later on in this text. When he talks about being unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we are to supplement knowledge with self-control. Real quick, a word about this grammatical style, this literary style. This is a form of argument called a sorites. This is a sorites. This is a form of argument where the predicate of the sentence becomes the subject of the next clause. So you see that here add to your faith virtue, and then virtue becomes the subject of the next one. Add to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge self-control. Now, self-control is a very hard thing to fake. Either you have it or you don't. To follow on the analogy we gave earlier about physical exercise, it's very obvious when someone has the self-control to continue in that for extended periods of time. It is something that is hard to fake. And this is a part of Christian maturation that you either have or you don't have. You can fake faith. You can fake virtue. You can even fake brotherly affection and love, but it's really hard to fake self-control. That's why it's a critical part of the Christian growth process. Self-control, steadfastness. I think these two things pair together very nicely. I will work out from time to time. I'll sweat, put in the work. I'll have a little bit of self-control for a little bit of time. But it's really difficult to do that day after day after day. And so endurance, steadfastness, patience, that's a part of self-control. It's a part of the natural growth progression. To that, you add godliness. And from godliness, we add brotherly affection. And then this culminates with love. Two of the principal Christian virtues here are at the ends of this chain. Faith, and love. Of course, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest of these is love. If you want to make a progression from faith to love, this progression takes this shape. How you think, what you know, how you act, how you act over time, how that manifests itself in your behavior, your godliness, your moral purity how you think about others, and ultimately how you act towards others, not just in your feeling, but love is an action here. All of this is a progression, a part of the Christian growth process. Peter doesn't want immature Christians in the church. He wants mature Christians, and he lays out a plan to get them there. And he tells us in verse 8 why this is so important. He says, if these things, the Greek literally says, if these things, the translators here put the word quality to make it clear that it's referring back to this chain of eight this chain of eight qualities, if these qualities are yours and are increasing. So it's important to note that this isn't a one and done thing. You have faith and then you add virtue and then you're done with virtue as if you've graduated on to the next quality. All of these must cumulatively increase. And if they are increasing, if these qualities are yours and they are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective. They keep you from being unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's that word again, knowledge here, of course, playing to this idea of Gnosticism that we'll talk about when we get to chapter two. Do you want to be an effective, fruitful Christian? Well, let these qualities be yours. Let them increase. When do they stop increasing? Never. They must be yours and are increasing. If you find yourself in a position where you might have some degree of these eight qualities, but they are stagnant, they are not growing, and they are not increasing, you are beginning to be ineffective and unfruitful. And if you lack these qualities altogether, you are so nearsighted that you are blind. The Greek here is actually very convoluted, is complicated. The word blind comes first in the Greek. And some some translators say, uh, you lack these qualities, you are blind. Or maybe another way of saying it is you are very nearsighted because you have forgotten that you were cleansed from your sins. This translation, the ESV says, you are so nearsighted that you are blind. I think that's probably right. That seems to make good sense. And why are you nearsighted? Because you forgot that your sins were forgiven. 
some distance has been put between your baptism when your sins were forgiven and where you are today. And that distance that has made you forget something. You are nearsighted. You only see what's immediately in front of you. You don't have the ability to look back through time and remember that you were cleansed from this former way of life. And when enough distance comes between the moment of your cleansing and forgiveness and where you are today that you don't see that at all, you don't remember who you are, who you belong to, and got what God redeemed you from, you become blind. Let the distance between your baptism and today be filled with an increased growth in these virtues. And he says in verse 10, therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. If you practice these, these things, these qualities, you will never fall. Of course, this implies that there is the real possibility of falling when so much distance comes between you and your salvation that you, instead of filling it with these virtues, you fill it with your own sin. If you want to make that calling and election sure, if you want to confirm it, you want to make sure you stand on a good foundation, let these things grow within you. And in this way, by the pursuit of these virtues, there will be richly provided. If we do the work of supplementing our faith with virtue and knowledge and so forth, God will provide for us an entrance into the eternal kingdom. Remember, it's the same Greek word here. It's the same Greek word here, provided and supplement. If we do the work of supplementing and growing our faith, God will provide to us an entrance into the eternal kingdom. Now, does that mean that we are earning our salvation? Of course not. It is God and God alone who provides us an entrance into this eternal kingdom. But God wants us to grow. God wants us to put forth every effort. It is not wrong to talk about how we must try to grow as Christians, but also talk about how our salvation is totally and completely accomplished by God. This text teaches that those two things go together. Thanks for joining us today on Begin in the Word. It's my hope that just as you have begun today in the Word of God, you will live out today in the Word of God.